Okay, so good afternoon, ladies. And for those that are not here, we'll listen to this. Good morning, afternoon, or night. Uh, today, we are going to continue. We started this um, trauma series from in January with the adult uh, class. And I hope that you're able to go back and listen to that. We're going to go to a part of what I said last time and just expand on that one. And with that said, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Here we are. Okay. And I'm going to bring this down. There you go. Okay, so what we want to uh, cover today are two fundamental needs that every human being has, and that is attachment and authenticity. And the way um, I would like to wrap this up in a nice little package in a bow is from the perspective of we are ministers of reconciliation. So what does that mean? How do we, you know, ministers of reconciliation, you know, we can talk about uh, reconciling the world uh, like he did with us. He reconciled us to himself, our father, and, uh, and ha has given us that ministry, right? But then what does that mean when you're talking about physically, emotionally, and mentally? there is another level of that reconciliation. And uh, I mentioned in the last um, call in the healing at the well, that there is a common trauma that we all have. Every human being on the earth <laughs> has the same trauma. And I talked first about the birth, which is very traumatic for all of us, but there is another one and it deals with this basic needs. And that is attachment and authenticity. So attachment, it is, um, it is something that we all need in order to survive. It is the closeness and proximity with another human being for the sake of being looked after or for the sake of looking after another. Now, and the importance of attachment is because without it, we can't survive. So this is part of what we've talked before about that brain stem where we have the survival mode. That is part of the survival mode is that attachment. We need it, so we cry to be fed, we cry for hurt, we cry, we, that is our basic uh, form of communicating to the outside world. I'm here and I can't do anything for myself, I need you. And when that is um, supplied by our caregivers, whether it's our parents, our grandparents, or um, whoever it is that's taking care of us, then, we'll see how that physically, how that um, develops. But um, if we don't have that, we die. That's why it's part of the survival mode. So then authenticity, it is being connected to ourselves. That means knowing what we feel and being able to act on it. And that is one of those things that we uh, loosely say, and sometimes don't even know ourselves what it means, but we sometimes say, oh, I just have this gut feeling, or uh, we just say, well, I, I don't know how to put it in words, but this is just the first thing that came to my mind, or we say things like that. We even talked about cognitive dissonance, and what that is, is we, we're all unique. We were all made in our father's image. And Abba put his fingerprint on each one of us. And his fingerprint is so big that we can just be one little line of that fingerprint, right? So um, we all have been wired in a certain way. And that comes in. I was talking to my daughter about that. She's pregnant right now. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've been listening to this. And she's a, 
um, she's a baker, but now she's studying farming. She wants to learn how to deal with the, with the end product from the beginning, how she treats the earth that brings out that um, grain to make the bread. So she said, this is the way I heard it. And it, it made a lot of sense to me, of course, because she's a farmer now, that we all are a unique um, seed. And that seed has in it everything that needs to become the tree that it will eventually be. And if your seed is a pear, and I decide that you're my kid, and I just want you to be an apple. So I'm going to make everything possible for you to be an apple, because you know what? I'm an apple, and I want you to be just like me. Well, your child is going to have this gut feeling of, but I'm not an apple, but she doesn't know how to express that yet. So she's going to have a conflict every time you set out rules that may not be what her gut feeling is telling her. That's part of her authenticity. So we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about how those two developed. The attachment, because we need somebody to help us and the, to survive. And we and the authenticity because there is I am already a seed, very different than my father and my mother. But my father and my mother, with all their love and care, are trying to make me the best tree ever, and they really don't know what I am yet. <laughs> so that is the part that us as parents is important in grandparents it's important that we understand so we can aid into that development and not hinder it in any way and two if that was not the case in ourselves uh, we didn't grow up with that type of nurturing environment we have suffered trauma and what do we do with it how do we deal with our own? Remember, we put our mask first and then we take care of our kids. So how do we do that? So we're gonna start with attachment. We're just gonna talk about those two things today, attachment and authenticity. So how about attachment? Attachment, um, how does that work physically? Okay, so we produce endorphins. These are, let me just move this in case you are, you can always take a picture of any of this so you can keep it and don't have to write all this down. So uh, those are internal opiate chemicals, which is really interesting. Uh, and they, fa they facilitate that attachment. So that means that our, we have uh, circuits in our brain that have receptors for that chemical. And when that chemical is produced, it's an endo. It means the inside. It's a, it's an opiate. It's an endorphin. It's it is like a, it is an opiate chemical, but we produce it ourselves. It's not coming from outside. So, when that is produced, there are receptors in our brain that they attach to, and creates the feeling that it's needed for whatever we use it for. So for example, if we take, um, they've done experiments with mice where they will knock off the, knock out the endorphin receptors. So what happened would, would be that then the activity in the brain that requires that, uh, that opiate activity, that endorphin activity, it's not present. So that means that then the mice are not crying for help. And if they are separated from their mothers, then they will, um, they will die. So that's one of the things that when there is a need, we uh, produce that and you know, we, we produce those endorphins to make us be heard, makes us want to communicate. Otherwise, you know, if I cry and cry and cry and my mom never pays attention to me, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to stop crying. Why do I even try? She's not going to listen to me. So that's what happens with those receptors. So in the case of this mice, they did it on purpose. But in, in our cases, sometimes we don't develop those properly because they're never um, they're never fed. They're never uh, uh, they're 
they, they're never created. It's kind of like if I don't, I, I cried and cried and cried, but I don't get that nice comforting feeling of being heard and of being taken care of, then I stop producing that endorphin and the receptors are never filled and then they start um, deteriorating or they may not develop as many as it, as, it's, as, uh, as it is needed. So it is important that we do. A lot of people say, oh, you're going to spoil that baby. Let him cry or let her cry. Uh, she'll finally fall asleep. Yes, they do fall asleep, but not because they learned anything what, positive. What they learned was, it doesn't matter if I cry, they're not coming to pay attention to me. So we don't want that. Ch children, babies do not get spoiled. The only way they have to tell you that they need something is by crying. That's the only language they have. So we can ignore that. Okay, so number two or letter B under attachment says, what happens to us for this process of attachment to occur? In childhood, when stress and trauma happens, these endorphin um, systems don't develop properly because the adrenaline rush of that in the cortisol of, the, of that stress and of that trauma that is happening, whether, you know, um, like I was mentioning the, this um, uh, psychiatrist that he was, it, he was born during the time of uh, World War II. Uh, the, the parent didn't have what it took to give that nourishment to her son. And uh, she would just, uh, all he could feel was the pain. He could feel, he could sense that the mother was stressed and her cortisol level and all that, but he doesn't know there is a war. He doesn't know that she's running from one place to another. She doesn't know, he, he doesn't know that she is trying to save him and trying to, uh, he, she actually sent, gave him up to, uh, after a year that he was born uh, to a family so that he could be saved and he would not go into a concentration camp, all these things. He doesn't know that she's doing it out of love. Sometimes we do so many things out of ignorance. So, but the child, all it's feeling is, I am not wanted. Uh, there is a problem with me. Let's say there is a divorce. Then they think that they were the ones who caused the divorce. They don't know. When we're born, we are very self-centered. <laughs> and that, that uh, explains a lot what you see people, there are adults and they're still very self-centered because what happens is that we have to be self-centered because I need to survive. I need you to take care of me. So it's all about me. And when I mature, I'm able to realize, oh, it's not all about me. There is others in this world too. <laughs> there are siblings, my parents, you know, other, my friends, my neighbors, etc. So then we learn to live in community. We have to learn to uh, share with one another, to be mindful of another. But when we're born, that's not part of our um, um, psyche. We are us. That's it. And the whole world revolves around me. And um, so that that is important that we understand it. I put it there in red because we sometimes think that um, that is, oh, that just happened to some people, you know, my parents weren't the best, but they, they were pretty good. I don't have that problem. Well, we'll continue to talk about this, but attachment is not a negotiable need. We all have it. We all need it. We all need to attach because otherwise we don't survive. And it is not just at the beginning is physically because if I'm not fed or if I'm my child, my diaper is not changed, then physically I can get sick. Uh, but then even if those things uh, are taken care of <clears throat> emotionally, I may not have any type of attachment. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we see that with caregivers, they come in and they do feed the child and bathe the baby and change the diapers, but they don't give the baby love and the attachment necessary for that baby to develop 
<clears throat> the receptors for that <clears throat> for the system to to function properly because what happens is <clears throat> it is an opiate right so when that is like I'm crying and crying and crying let's say I'm cold and um or I just want connection I just want to be with mommy so I'm crying and she really fed me and changed my diaper and I'm perfectly fine but I want her you know, I want to be close to her. So I cry and mommy holds me and soothes me. And I feel her body and I hear her heart because that's what we heard the most. So when we put a child in our chest, they're hearing our heart and they are like, ah, oh, it's like a warm blanket on them. And then they know, yes, this is, I am loved. I am safe. They feel that connection that remember the first one is, am I loved? Yes, I'm loved. Uh, the, the limbic is connection. Am I connected to someone? Somebody cares for me and loves me. Then that both get uh, appeased at that with that just little hold and the voice, I'm here, I'm here, you're okay. And then, or a touch. So then that is very powerful that is what says to the whole circuit it's working we can we can continue this communication i can cry and she will satisfy my needs and i trust her so it is a lot of things that are taking care at that moment and it is a very very powerful um process that happens and when it doesn't happen then think about it then what happens is because it is an opiate, what happens when I'm given opiates? <laughs> and then all of a sudden I, I feel this warm feeling, but it's coming from the outside. It's not coming from me. I'm not producing it myself. It's being produced by what has been given to me. And um, I automatically feel that connection. So then I get attached to that that has been given to me because I've been longing for that feeling since I was a kid. And so that is how addictions happen. So let's say I don't get it from somebody else. Nobody gave me drugs when I was a kid. So um, I, that was not something that I got attached to, but I did get attached to uh, when I performed in a certain way or I um, exercised because I did both. I was I was a performer. Uh, it's part of my personality. I'm an extrovert. So, you know, it's just the way we're wired. But then I loved exercising. So when I exercise, I produce those, those endorphins. And then I, be, whatever was giving me that, oh, when I became a believer, worship was the most exciting thing for me. And as I'm worshiping and I could feel that warmth embraced, it was like, uh, you know, I'm in heaven. This is the best ever because I have the physical, I have the emotional, and I have the spiritual all in one. And little did I know, I became an addict, uh, addicted to worship. I wanted to worship all the time. And it wasn't until one day I realized, so do I have this relationship with my father, even if I don't worship? That was a very rude awakening. And I realized, whoa, this is what I've been addicted to. And it has been good for me because it's been given me, I felt heard every time I sang and my voice came out, it was like, I've been heard by him. And it, that was something that was not um, satisfied as a kid. It's like, shh, 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 shh. children are to be seen, not heard. So it was like, I couldn't ask, I couldn't say quite, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. And as an extrovert, it's like, I want to talk. And I couldn't. So then you develop ways to create your own endorphin, or you get attached to others giving you endorphins. So <clears throat> that is very important that we understand that because we can be very judgmental. And I raise my hand, I've been very judgmental of people with addictions that are not, so to speak, uh, positive addictions, like a workaholic, you may hear somebody say, uh, she's just a workaholic, but 
they would not say, oh, she's a drug addict in the same way, right? Um, but then, um, you know, people overeat, people um, become workaholic. Um, I don't know what you would call it, exerciseholic. <laughs> I don't know. They just are all about exercising all the time. Um, or they get addicted to cards, to playing, to all kinds of things. Um, even even about to their physical look, uh, they'll just do surgery after surgery after surgery. And when you realize you don't recognize the person anymore because they don't look like who they are. Um, but it's like, it, it's an addiction. You can't stop. So uh, that is attachment. So let's go to the next one. Okay, do not go in. Authenticity. And this is a very um, interesting one to me because I, I kind of knew about um, that attachment for a while, obviously, since I started studying neuroscience and being a parent educator and working uh, with parents in child development, you, you know, that's, that's one of the must that you go to. But I really haven't uh, I wasn't, ne I never taught about authenticity uh, until I started doing mental health. And uh, that is a very interesting uh, part of our survival needs. And it says here, authenticity is a survival need, but what happens if your authenticity threatens <clears throat> your attachment, <clears throat> excuse me, your attachment relationship. So they're both a need they're both um, required for us to grow healthy, but authentic, uh, attachment goes first. And if being authentic, that means being who God created me to be, conflicts with me getting the love and the attention that my parents should give me because I needed to survive, then authenticity goes out the window. For example, I gave you this example, I think um, if it wasn't in last uh, call, it was in last call, parenting call, it, it was then in December, but about a, a child, a two-year-old that gets angry because she can't get that cookie before dinner. And the parents uh, can handle her screaming and her anger uh, because they grew up in homes that were rage due to alcoholism, drug abuse, or any type of abuse um, was present and they're terrified at, the, at their own expression of anger. So in order for them not to get angry at you and not be, to become like their parents were, they quiet you down. It's a matter of, I don't wanna go there, so I'm gonna stop you because it's dangerous for me. Do you see how? Uh, survival mode comes in at the end of uh, at that moment when when a parent does that the parent really what she is saying is I can't handle it anymore and I'm going to have to do what I need to do in order for me to survive so when a parent acts that way they are in survival mode and survival mode does not think I don't know how strongly I can repeat that over and over because it's we've been um, program differently, thinking that uh, adults are adults and they know better than us, and uh, which they should. Um, uh, but a lot of times, if they are in survival mode, we are not dealing with an adult. We are dealing with a child in the body of an adult that did not know how to control that when he or she were, uh, were that age. So that's important. It's because we need to grow compassion and that compassion grows that way. It's calm with, means with, passion. So we need to have that passion for our parents and for our loved ones and for our children and for anybody for that matter that we don't know, We've, we have not walked in their shoes. So we don't know why they're acting the way they're acting, but obviously by the fruit, we can see that we are not dealing right now. That doesn't mean that that person is a child all the time, but in the moment that you're pushing that button, you are dealing with a child. 
that was silenced, that was told, like what it says here, uh, the message that they're getting is good little kids don't get angry. But the message, that's what they're telling you, right? Good little kids don't get angry because they don't want you to get angry. Uh, and that's what they were told, not to get angry. And the way our hearts perceive that is angry little kids don't get loved. And why would we think that way? We would think that way because what is it that I'm seeing my mom and my dad respond? They get angry. I can see it in their face that they are showing me their anger. They are not talking to me. Or if they are talking to me, they're talking to me harshly. So then I realize, oh, if I scream, I don't get loved. So what happens? Depending on your authenticity of who you are, if you are a leader, you are going to demand <laughs> that you are cared for, and you're not going to take no for an answer. So you are going to continue to scream and continue, I want it, I want it, where's my cookie, I want it, and then you just won't stop. Because at this point, it is about conviction. I want that cookie, and I'm going to do everything I can to get my cookie, right? Because it's the way I'm wired. So, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to get my cookie. I'm just going to get a bigger spank. Um, and then that tells me, oh, okay. Uh, in order for me to get what I want, if I am assertive enough to say it is I get punished. So then I have to deal with, do I get punished? Is this worth getting spanked? Uh, uh, for, or do I just let go? And those are the things that authentic authenticity does in us. Now, let's say you're not a leader and you are perfectly fine. That's the way God made you to follow. So when that happens and you want to express yourself, but you've just been told not to, you fawn. You just, okay, mommy. And not say a word, not ruffle any feather because you want your mom to love you and you need that attachment. So, and it is perfectly fine because you were created to follow. So that's what you need to do. And there is no conflict in your mind until things are a little bit stronger and it's not a cookie, but it is more like, I want to wear this dress or this pants and your parents want you to wear the other one, whichever it is. So then it's a matter of like, but I don't want a dress. I don't want a pan pair of pants. I want this dress. And uh, so then it becomes the, this is my personality and you're coming against it. And then um, it, it, it has to, depending on your personality and how you're wired, if, if it threatens your attachment, that's number one, then you will give up your authenticity. You will say, oh, well, I, that was my gut feeling. You know, if something happens or, yeah, that's how I felt like, but you know, this, then that happened and mom said this or whatever. So yeah, I just let it go. And I, I just let it go. It gets to a point, just like those receptors, those opiate receptors that you just let go a lot of things and you don't care anymore and you become numb. And we see that a lot of in, in adults. I used to be this way. I don't feel that way anymore. I don't have that joy anymore. I don't have that, mm, that oomph that made me do things. It's like, I don't care anymore. And a lot of the times is squelched personality. Uh, and then we, 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 we see kids getting into their teenage years and it's always been, oh, it's just teenagers. You know, that's just the way they are. And, but it's not true. I lived with a lot of, uh, and knew a lot of teenagers that were not like that at all. And um, they were pretty content with their lives and they were not, um, and it wasn't because they fawn and they did whatever their parents said or anything. No, they had, they had their, their personality and they said what they believed and they had their convictions, but they were not, um, they were cared enough and they were allowed 
to be who they wanted to be by giving them choices when they're growing up, that that personality in them was not squelched. So when it came the time at, at a teenage year where you are, uh, you feel you feel freer and uh, not, we're going through a detachment period where you are eventually going to be on your own. So our body becomes more of I'm independent and I can do these things for myself and I don't need my parents because I, I can survive. I don't need them for survival. Then at that point, we start seeing their little personalities really surface. And what we end up doing sometimes erroneously, even when we are sincerely wrong, is like, oh, no, 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 no. You've always been this little boy or this good little girl. And what is going on? You have to be who you have always been. Well, they've always been that way because they needed you. And they were trying to be as compliant as they could. Uh, but now that they don't, that's when they say, I've been doing this all along. Um, I've been this height, I'm 5'7", since I was 12 years old. And my mom didn't know how to teach us uh, how to behave or not behave without a spanking. Everything had to be dealt that, that way. And uh, she didn't know when to stop. So it was, and that's the way she was raised. It wasn't like, you know, she was a mean mom. And no, that's the way she was very loving and kind and all that when she was not angry. Um, but that's the way she learned how to deal with anger. It was a program thing. It was an epigenetics thing. So um, what happens is that at age 12, my mom is 4'11". <laughs> I was a lot bigger than her. <laughs> so one day she was going to hit me and she raised her hand and I grabbed her hand and I looked down and I said to her, you will not hit me again. I didn't scream. It, I wasn't ugly. I just said, you will not hit me again. And my mom looked up and looked at me and said, okay. And that was the end of it. She didn't hit me again or my brothers and sisters that were younger than me. So it wasn't that I became this rebellious kid. It's like, no, I can speak for myself now. I've been silenced and, and you know, muted all these years. And now I, I can speak. I, I'm not afraid of you anymore. So I was letting my authenticity come up and be who I was created to be. Now, of course, that could have been done a lot differently. Uh, and like I said, I didn't call her names. I wasn't ugly to her. I didn't hurt her. I just stopped her hand. I didn't, you know, hurt her by squeezing her too hard or something. It, it wasn't any of that. But I didn't have to do that. It would have it would have not been necessary if I would have been raised differently because I still respected her by the way I treated her at that moment. So there was, there was an, uh, 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 an element of respect there, but it was like enough, enough. You're not doing this anymore. So that's what, our, um, what happens with our authenticity that it becomes squelched. And uh, that is traumatic. That is trauma because there is a part of you that goes, but uh, I, I, I feel like this is, shouldn't be this way. Why is it that it is this way? And so there's a turmoil and you, you think, well, they're my parents and they love me because you've seen them love you. So um, it must be that I'm wrong and they're right. And I just need to squelch that because that is not right because they don't like it. So you have this turmoil inside of you is the tug of war constantly. And it, they don't do it or we don't do it to our children with, with uh, ill intent. We just don't know any better. And we are trying to survive ourselves um, and stay 
where we need to be uh, calm and collected. And if that requires to squelch everybody around you, then so be it, because it's the only way I can survive. Okay, so I think we all got what authenticity and attachment is, right? So wh what do we do? Okay, because it's nice to know all that, but good riddance, help me overcome this. <laughs> and let's see what do we do from now on and how do we help our kids to overcome something that we probably didn't do it right. Or do you have little ones that they're just brand new and you can start them you know, fresh and that would be awesome. Okay, so there are three things. One, recognize what happened and the manifestations in the present. So what happens when I am pushed and I am, somebody's screaming at me and then all of a sudden uh, I just lie to you. You ask me a question and I'm like, I, I lied. And you're like, eventually, why am I lying? I didn't need to lie. But if that's something that I learned to do, uh, then that's what I'll do. Oh, let's say you're pushing the buttons and you you hear this all the time. You know, he was just playing in the, in the playground with a little friend and all of a sudden he was, bam, smacked the kid. And it's like, okay, nobody just smacked somebody. Okay, something happened. And, but the way this child learned was that whenever you this, do this, that or the other and you threaten me, I hit you. Because they were probably hit all the time. So they thought, okay, when my mom doesn't want me to do something, she hits me. So I, when I don't want you to do something to me, I'll hit you. That's just learned, right? So we have to realize what is it that I do when I'm pushed? I'll scream or I'll go into the silent treatment. I have somebody very dear to me that that's the way the spouse dealt with this person was, mm. I will not talk. And no matter what, but what's wrong, but tell me, no, nope, no words. So that's the way this person was treated and learned that the silent treatment was the way to go. And uh, so, you know, we come up with all kinds of ways to cope. So those are, you know, what is wrong with my spouse that's doing one, two, three, or four, or ABC? It's not the symptom what the problem is. Those are just coping mechanisms that they either learned or they, uh, well, they learned by others doing it to them or they learned by surviving. How do I deal with this is turning off. Uh, um, many of you know, um, well-known um, teacher and evangelist, and she said she was uh, abused and, um, the way she dealt with it was she checked out. So it was like somebody was doing something to her body, but she was not there. She learned to disassociate and then not be there because she had nobody to save her. And that just became a repeated um, offense in, in her childhood. So that's the way she learned. So what happens if I threaten her in, at work, I don't know, I know nothing about her life or anything like that, but I say something that it was a word that was a trigger for her. And then she just disassociates. And then I'm like, hello, I'm talking to you. What's going on? And that person is not there. And then we just think, oh, she just doesn't care. Well, no, that's not what she learned. I'm pushing her to a place that she can't handle it anymore. So then she goes she checks out or she hits me, you know, it depends whatever she learned. So we recognize what happened. I realized, oh, okay. I know where this is coming from. Yep. And um, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. So I have to change that, right? I have to find a way to overcome that wrong pattern. I've been going the wrong direction. Teshuva, repent and come back. That is the way I learned to act, but now I have a good father. I have somebody that does take care of me and I can redo. This is the best word ever, redo, <laughs> because we, we are not victims of our past. We can always redo anything that was done. It can be undone and can be redone. So you just 
think about it. And it will be um, conscious effort of, okay, so how do I do that? Um, let's say it was, I hit back. So, you know, the person just triggered me and I just want to throw something out. And then I just said, God is love. Take a deep breath. He loves you. And he loves that person too. And if I throw a whatever, a toy to that person, I'm throwing a toy to my father's child. Oh, no, I can't do that. So you do this little calisthenic in your mind and whatever it is, if you're a child, if you're an adult and you, when you get pushed against the wall, you lie, then you say, God is truth. I don't need to lie. I can tell the truth and it will, it will be okay. I can handle this. And then you respond. Uh, so you may have to do that over and over and over until finally truth come out of your mouth when, you, mouth when you're fearful and not a lie. Um, or I'm gonna take that from, you know, I'm a kleptomaniac and I just steal things. I don't need this. This doesn't belong to me. This belongs to that person. This belongs to this business. This belongs to whatever. Uh, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, whatever it is. I, I, if I want it, I can ask for it. If I want it, I can ask for it. You know, you just say that over and over and you create a new neural pathway. That is, it takes time. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. You reconnect, number two, we reconnect reconnect with yourself by restoring the connection with your body primarily. Everything we do, and we talked about this a lot in day six of creation, man and beast were created. So there is a separation there between man and beast in the way that we do have a beastly tent. We were made just like the animals from the earth, but the animals don't have the brain and uh, the mind of Messiah, like we do. So I need to separate that in my mind, but it all starts first uh, physically and then it becomes spiritual. So our first connection has to be our body and be aware of our bodies. One uh, little exercise that you can do with your kids is give them paper and pencil and ask them to draw themselves their house and um and that's it and and you know they can draw if they want to a family member if a child is not connected with their body they will draw the person and the house in the air you will not see a line where that house is on you won't see grass and little trees and even the trees may be in the air there will be no no grass in the bottom or roots. Um, and they may be bigger than the house. And, and children don't have proportions. I'm aware of that. But the way they, they, dry, they, they dr draw themselves in comparison to their home tells you what, how they feel about themselves and how they feel about their home. Um, so if that's the case, if the house is in the air, the trees are in the air, that he is in the air or she's in the air, they need to be connected. They need to have a body, a development of connection in their body. And that can be very easily done. The, that's why jumping is so uh, good for them. And they do it all the time. We're constantly saying, don't jump, don't jump, uh, because we think they get, they get hurt, but they need that. They need to have that connection in their bodies. And um, you can hold them while they jump. You know, you want to jump in the bed? Okay, let's do it safely. Let me hold your hands. Now you can jump. And then they can jump. They're not going to break the bed unless, you know, they're 200 uh, pounds heavy. Um, there's a little child and we tell you, you're going to break the bed. No, they're not. So just grab their hands and let them jump or they can get on the bed and jump to the ground and let's jump again and jump again. And then just need to have that hit the, the body, their feet need to hit the ground. Um, 
they can do um you can do pillow um fights with them and then they can feel the effect on the body you can do rough housing just roll over the carpet with them um you can do all kinds of exercises where they can feel their body do headstands uh you hold their little feet for handstands and you know all kinds of things that they can feel their bodies and they have that awareness of space then uh the third one is reconnect your emotions that you lost. And once you do that, you can find these things again. And that is what it's called recovery. So recovery is finding those things that you have lost. And if the feeling was, you know, you, you see your child getting upset about something, you can say, oh, are you okay? And they'll say, you know, yes or no, or, um, but you can see in their face that they're not okay, even though they say, yes, yes, I'm okay. Well, you can say what you see. Your face looks like this. And you try to make the same face that they're making so that they can see a mirror. And I'm like, oh, I may say I'm okay, but I, you're seeing my face and now I'm seeing my face in yours. So that is helping them connect with their emotions. I see that you didn't like that. I said, don't do this. What would you, do you like to do? And just let them, it's not like, oh, okay, because he told you this, that, or the other, you're going to change the rules. No, the rules are still the same. You know, if it's not, you're not going to go out in the, at midnight, you can still keep your rule, but what would you have done? What, what is it that you wanted to do? It's, let them express what they wanted to do and why they wanted to do you can have a great time a teaching moment right there and get to know your child better of why is it that they feel like they need to escape from something and they don't want to be home so you know there is all kinds of things so that's that's the process of recovery and and it is too vast uh, to cover in this time but just to get the idea of what it is so, um, and then, you know, the question, what do people find in this recovery? They find themselves. They find the loss of the self, of that um, authenticity that they have to squelch and push away uh, in order to save their attachment that was more important for survival. And that that is really the essence of trauma. And I wrote it really big there. I'm not screaming. I just wanted to make a point that the loss of self is the essence of trauma. So when I can be me, because I have to be whatever you want me to be, that is traumatic to my authenticity. That is traumatic to who God created me to be. And I'm not being developed into a pair. I'm being pushed to be an apple that I am not. So it's important that we understand that because we are stewards of our children. They don't belong to us. They belong to God. God made them. Our father made them with a personality just like he made every single one of us. And we're here to be the nurturing parent to grow that child to be the man and the woman that God created them to be, not to be the one that I wanted to be and I couldn't. So I'm going to make my kid be everything. I, I wasn't given this, that, and the other. I'm going to give it to my baby because I want her to have everything I didn't have. I never liked dolls and my mom never had dolls. So I had more dolls that I can play with. I had shelves of dolls in my room that I never even touched. But it was important to my mom and it, it hurts me to even think about that now because I just remember getting so angry when I got another doll and everything that came out, if they walk, I had it. If they ate it, I had it. If whatever new doll came out, they danced, they moved, they skate. I had them all. And, uh, and I, did, I didn't like them. I didn't play with them. So you would have think, well, she doesn't seem to like the dolls. Why don't I talk to her and find out what is it that she really likes uh, instead of keep giving her something that I want? So that is why we need to have reconciliation. We need to reconcile ourselves with who 
God created us to be that for one reason or another might have not been the way we grew up and make sure that we don't do that to our children and grandchildren and help our children realize that in the lives of our grandchildren the best way we can. And that's why we are ministers of reconciliation. We need to reconcile ourselves first. And it's more than just like, oh, I wasn't safe and now I'm safe. I wasn't going to heaven and now I am. You know, it's not that at all. It's a lot more complex than that because I can share something with you that I don't have. I have to chew the cut. I have to eat it and chew it again. And it comes up and I chew it again. That's why he gave us, you know, he, he, he gave rumians for that should say something, number four, right? Four stomachs. So it would come up and up and up again and again. He tells us to meditate. That's the same word than um, that a ruminant, just to chew the cut over and over and over. And we chew the cut, we chew the word over and over and over. So that is what I have for today. And let me open this up for, okay, for discussion. Uh, so 308, but we really started at 315. So we are right on time. So be free to open up and ask any question. I'm gonna try to read here your comments. <laughs> oh, Danielle, I say the same thing. Why didn't I learn all this when I had my kids? <laughs> Reading yours, Mary Kate. Huh. You know, it's funny, Simi, because literally right when you entered into the two-year-old tantrum part of your call, he yeah. he truly was having a tantrum, and, um, but he's tired, like he's fighting a nap, and so, and Brent just got home from being out of town, so the, ki the kids kind of act funny when he's gone, and then he comes mm -hmm. back, and so, you know, me and Brent are both there. Your classes have changed a lot. Or we actually started off when we first had Raya as gentle parenting. And then when we lived at my in-laws, we kind of fell into the more traditional parenting per their like influence, you know, like, well, you need to spank them. They did this, you know. And then when we got out, we went back, kind of, we've kind of gone back and forth. And poor Raya has kind of been through like the first child guinea pig kind of stuff you know I feel bad for her but like Isaac you know throwing that tantrum it was so funny I was laughing I was like you know trying not to laugh but I was looking at Brent and I was like in the middle of the parenting call she just now was talking about a two-year-old tantrum and Brent was like you have to type it in there it's so real life but I mean I just let him like ram his head into my legs and and then he would say leave me mine alone and I'd say you want me to you want me to leave you alone can we give you some space and he'd say yeah and so I'd kind of step away and then he'd come running like no and he didn't know what he wanted but I just kept telling him I love you I know you want to go outside but it's freezing cold mommy doesn't want your toes to fall you know like I'm like your little toes are gonna fall off if they freeze you know <laughs> but well you just lied to your kid Mary Kate <laughs> hypothermia is that not real long, if they stay long enough just by going a minute out there totally well, not gonna fall <laughs> context he had already been out there Britt's like he came home from being out of town he's like babe he's in a diaper and it's freezing cold outside and I was like well I mean he's grounding himself you know with the earth <laughs> and he said and for a little crazy. bit it's actually really good for his immune I know. system we call him baby Wim Hof because but he's done it so many times that brent was really truly it was like a concern his fingers were bright red he couldn't feel them <laughs> yeah we don't we don't want to go there yeah okay and so, hold on one second let me end the record the recording yes yeah, so people can uh talk okay so this is goodbye to everyone we are just having our after party time and uh, I hope this was helpful to you and if you have any questions please let me know.
there you go. So anyway, 